As we head into the final international break of 2024, thank God, today I'm going to round up round 15 of the championship. Starting off at Vicarage Road on Friday night, Watford come out 1-0 winners over Oxford United. And let's be honest, is there really any surprise here? Watford's home form is quite outstanding, you have to say. Their sixth win in seven home games. They just keep on doing it down at the Vic. Oxford, though, deserve credit, I thought, as they have continued to be so far this season. They proved to just continually be really, really competitive, whether it's home, whether it's away. Des Buckingham just deserves so much credit for how he's got this Oxford team, who, let's not beat it around the bush. They come up, they were a playoff side, they snuck into the playoffs, they were by far the most unfancied of the three newly promoted teams. How he's got them adapting to the league is quite remarkable. And even when they've lost games and they have lost a few, they've been competitive for the most part. And I think that in itself is just, yeah, incredibly impressive as they were once again right here. Watford though win at home once more. And this will go one of two ways for Watford. They'll either improve away from home, remain consistent at the Vic and prove to be a solid playoff contender or if their home form drops off a little bit and they prove to have been quite reliant on it and their away form doesn't improve, they will slip down into mid-table. So I think there's still a side that I can't quite hang my hat on. It's either going to go one way or the other but Tom Cleverley deserves immense credit too because they weren't fancied very much at the start of the season. And the first 15 games have been up and down, but a lot of them have been very impressive. Cardiff 1, Blackburn 3. This is the championship in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. Cardiff had an outstanding home run of games under Omar Rizza especially. They'd won four in a row up until this point, scoring 10 and conceding only one at the Cardiff City Stadium. Meanwhile, Blackburn's away record had been absolutely wretched. This was their first Away win all season, so safe to say this was an Acker buster on anyone's coupon this weekend, but I've got to tell you, Blackburn looked fantastic here. Some of the football, some of the goals they were scoring was absolutely fantastic. More of the Blackburn, I think we sort of saw at the start of the season, very ruthless, very incisive, and it's a great response from them following two home defeats and three defeats in a row without scoring. So a good response for Blackburn just in time for the international break. We'll see how they pick it up when they get back. Cardiff, yeah, I wouldn't say the Omar Rizza bubble has burst just yet. A very good start has come to an end. I don't know what the hell is happening on the new manager front down at Cardiff. Maybe they'll be wanting to use this international break to finally make a decision on Omar Rizza. But I think despite this result, he still deserves a fair crack at the whip as the permanent Cardiff City manager. One defeat from you know his first five home games as Cardiff City manager. That's far from a bad record. He's still done really, really well. Borough 5, Luton Town 1. As always, I did a full Project Borough review of this game in depth on this very channel. So check that out if you want to see me go right deep diving into this one. But this was, for the second game in a week, absolutely ruthless from Borough. We've teased this for the whole season, you know, time and time again, game after game, especially in the early few weeks of the season, you know, 20 shots on goal, countless shots on target, ridiculous XG, but terrible finishing. And we're starting to see that even out now because when this Borough team is ruthless, they put an absolute ton of goals past the opposition. Now, it is worth noting we were going up against a very poor Luton Town side and Luton were desperate here. Everything I associate with Luton Town as a team, hard-working, tough defensively, aggressive, difficult to break down. None of that was evident here. And although Borough's goals were carved open impeccably well, and some of the quality of goals here were absolutely top draw, it's the, potentially the final nail in the coffin for Rob Edwards. And I will be doing a more in-depth video tomorrow on the number of managers, or the few managers I think could be in trouble in this international break, one of which, of course, is Rob Edwards. But this looked like the sort of game that could prove to be the end of what has been a fantastic tenure, but unfortunately, a dismal start to the season for a team that simply should not be anywhere near where they are. But Borough pick up momentum before the international break. It's all about whether we can pick it back up and continue this on 
afterwards because it's clear the quality is in this Borough team to be a challenger. That's always been the case. Luton will be a team to watch over the next two weeks because if they are, if they do make a change, which I think is very, very likely, do they go for Mark Robbins? Who do they bring in? And do they start improving when they get back? Because they simply have to. Stoke City 1, Millwall 1. It looked like Millwall were going to do a Millwall. Win 1-0. On the road, at home, doesn't matter. They win games narrowly, they keep clean sheets, but it wasn't to be here against Stoke City, who pulled one back in the second half on the hour. And that, I think, makes it a good point for Stoke City. You know, I really do. I, I still don't know quite where they're going to go under Nasi's Palash and whether they'll just end up doing a Stoke and finishing mid-table, which is exactly where they are right now. But Hillwall have been on a fantastic run. And to get a point off them, is no mean feat, I would say. So, still a good point for Stoke. I will point out they should have been given what looked like a blatant penalty for a pullback in the box by Cooper at 1-0. And that, of course, could have possibly changed the complexion of the game. So, Stoke do deserve a little bit of sympathy for that. But either way, it's a point against Millwall. And I think even from Millwall's point of view as well, they still remain unbeaten. Seven unbeaten now. They didn't get the clean sheet, they didn't get the victory today, but their turnaround in form has been absolutely fantastic. What I will say, I don't know how sustainable this run of form is in terms of how clinical they are. They only had one shot on target here, and they put it away. So, yeah, we'll see if this is just a purple patch for Millwall, or if they'll continue it. Their underlying numbers are still very, very impressive regardless, but yeah, I think both teams will see this as a pretty useful point. Derby won, Plymouth won, you've got to say this is a good point for Plymouth just down to how bad the standard has been from them on the road this season and on top of that Derby's home record has been quite the opposite, it's been actually really really good for the Rams so far this season but you've got to talk about that overhead kick from Jerry Yates, an outstanding overhead kick from him, once again no surprise that a Derby goal comes from their biggest threat which is set pieces but fair play to Plymouth you know I still don't think they looked all that great they didn't create anywhere near as much as Derby only two shots on target arguably I think it's safe to say they were the second best team here but they kind of did a Derby you know we've seen Derby go away from home many times this season and not create much but take their chances when they've come and on quite a few occasions they've took something away from wherever they've travelled, despite not being the most creative of the two sides, or the better side, really. But Plymouth did derby to derby, really. A deflected free kick from Randall just before half-time was enough to rescue only Plymouth's second point on the road this season. And it was only their second goal on the road this season. So I still wouldn't say they've, by any means, turned a corner on the road. It still is a huge concern, in my opinion, for Plymouth going forward this season. So, Plymouth, I think they'll take a point. You know, deflected free kick went in their favour. Derby, I think, will have looked at this as a home game where they really should be getting three points from, and I think they'll be disappointed that they didn't. Leeds 2, QPR 0. Like Leeds' last home game against Plymouth, you expect nothing different here from this home game. QPR, well, I'll get on to them in a minute but I think Leeds again as I've said quite a few times this season their only real criticism is that they didn't score more and I guess on another day albeit a very rare occasion given how terrible QPR were at 1-0 they didn't quite kill the game off maybe the nerves were you know jangling a little bit until Joel Perot put that second goal in in stoppage time but even then you know you look at the statistics Leeds destroyed QPR like they did in their last home game as well, XG really, really high, 21 shots, 6 on target. As I say, my only criticism of Leeds is that the goal, the game wasn't put away earlier, but QPR posed absolutely no threat whatsoever, and you've got to start questioning what may happen in the international break for Marty Sifuentes. They're now winless in 11, and another away trip where they were basically anonymous. Five shots, none on target. You're not going to get much on the road from that, I'm afraid. And I am concerned by QPR. And when I think back to that Friday night, I think it was where they come from behind to win at Luton. I can't remember where they were in the table at that point, but I remember watching that game thinking, QPR look all right. And they look like a mid-table team. They look like they're taking a definite step forward in the Sifu Enters, which we all thought they would. But since then, it's quite worrying how far they've dropped off and, and how poor they look 
going forward, especially. So, Leeds, you know what? It's a game they should win. I'm not surprised by this result at all. Anything other than a win would have been disastrous, but QPR now dropped to the bottom of the championship, and I do worry that a change may be imminent down at Loftus Road because, yeah, Marty Sifuentes took them from this position under Gareth Ainsworth, and unfortunately, somehow, they found themselves ex exactly back there again, which is worrying. It's really, really worrying, and a change might be imminent. Norwich nil, Bristol City 2. Norwich's unbeaten home run, which has lasted over a year, is over. Bristol City are the team who went to Carroll Road and finally put Norwich away and kind of been coming. You know, Borough should have definitely put Norwich away a few weeks ago when we went to Carroll Road. It should have been 4-1 Borough at one point. Norwich were pulled out of the fire by some unbelievable quality from Borgia Signs and a comedic own goal that day. I feel like it's kind of been coming for Norwich. Their form has dropped off quite significantly. Third defeat in a row, scored just once. They're winless in six. It's a little bit of a worrying drop-off in form for Norwich, and I don't know if there is a, an argument to suggest. And I did say this, you know, in my Project Borough, when I previewed the Borough game against Norwich all them weeks back, I did say everything they did, all their goal contributions pretty much went through Science and Sargent. So maybe there is an argument to suggest that once them two go through a little dip in form, their over-reliance on that two, that pair, might become quite prevalent. And that might be the case here, because as I say, the goals have dried up. So you do worry for Norwich that when them two aren't on song, is there enough elsewhere in the team to continue to pick up results for Norwich? Because it's quite a worrying run that they've come on. I thought they'd be a you know, playoff dead cert, but they've dropped right, right into mid-table now. So they've now been beaten at home. How will they react? We'll have to wait and see. But Bristol City, as I say, quietly have been plucking away and have done really, really well. Obviously, they lost out to Sheffield United last time out. A brilliant comeback despite Bristol City leading their form has still been really, really good. They're unbeaten in five away games, one defeat in ten. Instead of Norwich being a playoff contender, maybe we need to start looking at Bristol City. Portsmouth 3, Preston 1. What a win for Pompey. Desperately, desperately needed and what a way to cap it off with a penalty from Colby Bishop. It couldn't have been a better scenario really for Portsmouth. I think it was pretty much the dream reaction the dream result that they wanted they needed before the international break it's just dragged them back into the pack somewhat and I think getting that first win at Fratton Park especially is huge because that should be a fortress that should be a huge asset to Pompey in terms of how they pick up points but a brilliant brilliant result for Pompey an unbelievable screamer by Josh Murphy that has to be mentioned as well so we'll see if this can finally be the kickstart to Pompey's season that they've been crying out for and they can start climbing out of the relegation zone. Preston, a little bit of a worry, you know, that initial new manager bounce. Is it starting to just dissipate under Paul Heckingbottom? I still feel like they're good enough at Deepdale, but their away form is a worry. They've not won away since March, I believe. And I think they're five without a win just in general now. So Preston's little... Increase in performance, that little new manager bounce seems to have possibly disappeared now and they need to be careful they don't get dragged into the bottom three because they are right in amongst that big group of clubs that are hovering dangerously above the drop. But Pompey, delighted for them. A big, big win. Here's hoping they can build on it. Sunderland 2, Coventry 2. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I was not expecting this when I looked and I saw Sunderland were 2-0 up. I thought, game, set, match. In fact, this could be quite ugly for Coventry. And I remember when Coventry got that win against us last weekend and a lot of Cov fans said, oh, we, we always get you know, good results at Borough, we always get good results at Sunderland. And maybe the answer to Coventry's problems is they just relocate to the North East because they'd probably be in the Premier League by now if that was the case. But in all seriousness, given the turbulence this week at Coventry, the loss of Mark Robbins and... How, well, from what I can gather, 90% if not more of the Coventry fan base are really upset and saddened by that decision and believe it was the wrong one. I think this was a wonderful, wonderful point by the Sky Blues. I really, really do. The Stadium of Light has been an absolute fortress for Sunderland this season and to come away with anything 
is a fantastic result, never mind 2-0 down. So with all the context around the club, just Coventry situation in general, I think it's a fantastic point for them and you know, a great fighting point that maybe they, they earned for Mark Robbins, I don't quite know, but it all depends on who Coventry get in next. I've seen the odds and the bookies have Frank Lampard, which I think is a, a, a terrible decision, if I'm brutally honest. I think that's Coventry going for a big name for the sake of it, and I really don't believe it's the right decision for them, but we will see. For this result, it's great for Coventry, and Sunderland have drew three in a row now, and on another day, they... You know, both of their goals that they scored were absolutely outstanding worldies. You know, Isidore's was a fantastic volley. Serkin's goal was an absolute screamer. So again, possibly an overperformance in front of goal from Sunderland in terms of how often do them goals go in? Because you look at the stats, it was quite an even game in terms of the shots, the XG going both ways. Kov actually had more big chances than Sunderland. So listen, I'm not surprised to see a drop off. And I'll repeat what I've said in the last two. They're not losing games, which is still a massive, massive benefit for Sunderland. But they have stopped winning them as well. And the chasing pack are slightly clawing their way into view. So maybe it's a good time for an international break for Sunderland. And we'll see if they can keep the chasing pack away from them when the international break is over with. And play resumes after in the Christmas period. It's going to be a thrilling Christmas period to see if they can hang on to that top spot or if the teams in behind them can catch them. Sheffield United won Sheffield Wednesday nil. God, I love this game. This is one of my favourite fixtures of the season. It's the one I look out for as a more as a neutral, if anything, the Steel City Derby. Absolutely fantastic. And you know what? Wasn't the greatest game, as it hasn't been over the last few meetings. You know, at least it wasn't goalless, is all I can say. But Sheffield United did what they do at home they get themselves in front and they manage the game brilliantly and I've not seen Sheffield United live very often this season but I've mentioned frequently how great they are at picking up clean sheets and how many games they win to nil and the one big thing that I watched and saw and I was incredibly impressed by was Sheffield United's game management it's almost like once they went one nil up that was it there was no doubt into which which way the game was going to go you know Sheffield Wednesday made changes, they gave it a good go and fair play to them, but Sheffield United just had that little bit of quality on the day and then they should have shop and, as I say, managed the game perfectly well. So I wouldn't say there was a gulf between the two sides in this game. You know, the one shot that was on target was the goal. Other than that, there wasn't much in it. You know, Sheffield United's eight, eight shots, the, all the others weren't on target, none of Sheffield Wednesday's were on target and the XG was identical 0.58 for United 0.57 for Wednesday I think both teams can come away saying it was a fairly equal game and Sheffield Wednesday can albeit it will sting massively they weren't outclassed they weren't completely outplayed by Sheffield United it was just that moment of quality from Tyrus Campbell that made the difference but who cares bragging rights is all that matters in this game and Sheffield United got the win got themselves right up alongside Sunderland at the top of the league table and I think most importantly for them, ensure that for this moment, Sheffield is red. Hull 1, West Brom 2. A big, big win for West Brom who get back to winning ways. You know, they were winless up until this point in the last seven. It's the first win in eight. And I think the biggest thing for West Brom is they actually scored in this game. They scored two. A quick fire double from Grant and Madger got them on the scoreline, got them ahead. And I think to just get Grant and Madger scoring, I think it's big for West Brom with the you know poor run in front of goal that they've been on at the moment and despite Hull City trying to come back into it West Brom defended their box brilliantly in the second half so a big result to get West Brom back into the mix unfortunately for me they knocked Borough back out of the playoffs again as for Hull yeah, there's quite a bit of discontent down there on Humber's side I've saw a couple of things online about the style of play and how it's just not working you know, whatever Tim Volta is trying to implement is just not working with the players there and it's being called mad, it's being called suicidal. Maybe he's trying to play a style and he just doesn't quite have the quality of players to play it. You know, if you're playing a very high-risk style of football, you need to be absolutely bulletproof at both ends of the pitch and I just don't think Hull have the quality of players and despite that really brief purple patch where they beat Stoke, they beat Cardiff who were in an absolute wretched run, they beat QPR who we've come to see are probably one of the worst if not the worst team in the league right now so Hull's purple patch come when they played three arguably favourable sides since then their form's fallen off a cliff and they're winless in seven 
and are now looking massively over their shoulders. So maybe he'll panic and make a change. But I think so far, the loss of quality, the change of manager, all the decisions made in the summer by the chairman, doesn't look like any of it's paying off. Finally, Burnley won. Swansea nil. On the balance, you could say Burnley edged it and deserved the win here anyway. But both teams had chances up until the 94th minute penalty to get the game won. Swansea had one off the line. But in the end, Burnley pulled through, which is what the best teams do. And to be fair, they were a lot more threatening than what they have been in front of goal this time round, if I'm honest. You know, we've had two teams here that don't score many goals. Burnley have scored three in the last eight, not in the last three. Swansea have only scored four in their last eight. But I think given Burnley's performance, Burnley's form... Winless in four, this was a big, big win for them. And I think possibly it's fair, safe to say they just edged it. Looking at the highlights, I don't quite know what the penalty was for. It looked like a handball, I think. It looked a bit harsh, but I've not looked at it that much. So I don't know if it was or not. Burnley and Swansea fans might have to tell me in the comment section. But it just stifles Swansea's good run of recent form. And most importantly for Burnley, it gets them back right into the mix of the top six. Because they were just hanging on a little bit. And a couple of teams could have been eyeing them up to knock them out of the top six but that win just gets them right back into the top four although i'm still far far from convinced by them so then finishing up with the championship table as we take a brief break into the international break and well the top three it's rather exciting isn't it i still stand by the fact that the top three are you know just a slight level above everyone else right now but sheffield united and leeds have certainly close the gap on Sunderland so it'd be interesting to see how they react to the teams who went around right on Sunderland's shoulder and it was a bad weekend for Sunderland really because the six teams below them all won literally from Sheffield United down to Borough all of them teams won so not much change in terms of the order of the top six the top six have just gotten that little bit closer and the race for the playoffs is really exciting as well because from Burnley all the way down to Bristol City, you know, five points separating fourth from tenth. Bristol City were actually in the top six, I think, at one point this weekend. So it just shows how quickly it can change. I think the same could be said for Millwall as well. So the race for the top six is extremely exciting. Then there's a bit of a gap to a, a mid-table group who are kind of just sat, settled now. It is worth mentioning, you know, looking at Norwich, how far they've slipped into the bottom half. Now that's a little bit of a concern but I think you now look at Coventry down maybe even Oxford down you could even pair Norwich and Sheffield Wednesday and that you know only three points above Cardiff the fact that Norwich are three points off of the bottom three is bonkers to me and shows how ridiculously tight this league table is and, and I mean you know the number of teams on 15 points alone it could flip and move around so much so that final relegation spot properly up for grabs and it says a lot that despite Cardiff's recent resurgence under Omar Rizza they're still in the bottom three it's bonkers this league it really really is but I think QPR are the team to be really really worried you know at least Portsmouth have dragged themselves within three points of safety and have a win on their side QPR are absolutely flawed one win on the board that win come 11 games ago, they are seriously slipping away from the rest of the division at this current rate. Five points from safety, not good enough at all from Rangers. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section below on your team this weekend, your thoughts on the results and what you think might happen after the international break, of course. I will be back just before that to preview and predict the round 16 fixtures but we can take a bit of a breather but that doesn't mean the championship content is going to stop because as I mentioned I am going to do a video tomorrow or the day after which is going to be discussing managers who I think could be at risk of the sack over this international break I'm going to bring videos grading each team's start I'm going to look at the bookies updated championship league table we're also going to look at the expected championship league table based on expected points as well as loads of other fun content to come. So just because it's the international break, the content doesn't stop. But if you've enjoyed the content and you haven't subscribed yet, do subscribe to the channel and hit a bell so you never miss when a video drops. Do support the video by giving it a like. And as I say, leave me your thoughts in the comment section below. But until the next one, guys, do take care. And I'll see you all in the next one.